See, nothing gets done without, you know, the boss around. The boss. That's, that, that's, that's, that's the work. Right. Are you going to do introductions? Oh, I'll let you know. Oh, all right. I've been doing from the back of the room. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so uh, let's see. We get to the schedule. Okay, so. Uh, first up in this hour is uh, a little time that you're going to talk about the metaverse, the future of legal education. Hello, everyone. My name is Karina Condra. I am from the University of Denver Stern College of Law, where I'm a law librarian there as well as assistant professor. Um, hopefully, I'll try to talk loud <laughs> and you can hear me for those in the room. Um, but I decided to propose this uh, presentation because um, I had been seeing a lot in the media um, using the word the metaverse uh, recently, and it kind of recalled back to when I read uh, Snow Crash. It was like, why are they using the word metaverse? So um, I kind of thought maybe we could start the conversation as to whether or not the metaverse is the future of legal education and where we're at with the metaverse. Um, so the metaverse, the term, was actually coined by Neil Stevenson and his 1992 um, novel called Sto Snow Crash, uh, basically referring to a 3D virtual reality space that citizens could escape to. Um, and now, as we're talking about it, companies are looking at how to build the metaverse. So what is the metaverse as we kind of think about it now? Now, you can find many different versions of definitions of what actually is the metaverse. This is the most general one that I found on Webster's. It's the concept of a highly immersive virtual world where people gather to socialize, play, and work, and to me, also maybe to learn, right? So it is um, slightly different and incorporates AR and VR. It is not the virtual reality. It is a meeting place, an online virtual world that does not exist yet. Um, that is being created right now. So when we're talking about um, what is available in some instances now, augmented reality, which basically overlays visual elements, sound, or other stimuli over what you're seeing. So if I overlay something in this classroom, 
Virtual reality is a completely computer generated simulation of a alternate world. So this is what we're getting uh, with gaming um, and um, things like that. Uh, or if you go to some of the um, new uh, um, kids play um, rooms, you'll see virtual reality uh, implemented there. It is not the metaverse, though. The metaverse incorporates AR and VR um, technologies and realizes a world where different universes can um, communicate together. So Meta or Facebook <laughs> um, is now thinking about building uh, their version of the uh, portion of the metaverse. Uh, Roblox is actually one of the forefronts of getting into um, uh, building a metaverse for educational tools. They're building virtual worlds. Companies are doing this and building virtual campuses. There's a great um, NPR radio broadcast recently interviewing an architect who was hired to be build a virtual campus for a company. Um, so it's, it's a building of a virtual world. Examples of what it, it exists and uh, companies that are kind of at the forefront of this. Second Life is probably the one that we've talked about in education the most um, over the past 20 years. Um, if you ever read Ready Player One or watched the movie, I think that is the really the best visualization of it so far in the movies. Um, Fortnite uh, and Roblox are games that are used um, by my niece, or she or niece, and it gives them that virtual reality experience almost to the level of um, of a metaverse. IMV, IMVU is a kind of a like chat system um, that's a uh, virtual reality. And Pokemon Go, which is kind of augmented reality, um, there. Now, if we connected all of these in their worlds, maybe then we would start building a metaverse. So current uses in education. Really, what we're using in education now, uh, it's mainly being done in um, K through 12 education. It's virtual reality, right? We're not at the level of metaverse, but it's being used heavily in medical education, flight simulators. And as a note, my dad's a pilot. He's been using flight simulators and different variances since the 80s since I was a kid. He would bring home these like computers where he would test um, whether or not he could fly without sight and just instrument panels. Um, some of the most high tech VR right now is at United and all the airlines where you go into fake jets and you can practice landing and things like that. Um, historical reconstruction. So in, um, uh, we're seeing a lot of world being built for educational purposes, showing students historical Greece, um, historical Egypt. Another um, instance where this is very useful, architecture. Because you can, with virtual reality, one of the big benefits of it is you can manipulate things in 3D. So any uh, geometry, learning geometry, when you can actually plot out of a um, triangle, do things like that, that becomes a reality and um, really aids. If you can operate on a virtual person without at first, without um, having a, a blood there to kind of <laughs> distract you, <laughs> that you can see how that could be helpful, right? So. That's where most of the empirical studies are being done for education right now. Um, if you were to look at um, studies about how the, this um, virtual reality is being used and whether or not it's effective, 
it's in these areas. Not really, I didn't see that much in the law yet. So what they have found with um, researching this, both on higher education level and um, K through 12, the strengths are you're giving the students a, a chance for active learning. You're taking them out of the classroom, which increases student engagement. You're not physically taking them out, but you're allowing them to move and um, and kind of um, work with an environment outside of just a desk. It has been shown to improve memory retention and recall. Um, they're able, especially in the historical settings, to recall historical facts because it felt like they experienced it, right? And this is similar. Has anybody ever taken a history class where you had a really engaging professor and he painted a picture in his mind and in your mind, and then you were able to really grasp that um, information? Another thing you practice in a safe environment. This is really helpful for pilots. <laughs> uh, if you're going to crash land, it's better to do it in a virtual world than um, out in practice. Um, although I'll get to some of the problems with practicing in a safe environment. Um, so that's what the research has shown has been the benefits of these. Current uses in legal education. So again, this is the use of virtual reality or augmented reality in um, legal education. I found a couple of um, sources. Um, crime scene recreation. Uh, Jenny has practiced with this. <laughs> um, they're using a 3D camera to create a virtual reality crime um, scene that allows students to kind of recreate the crime. This could be used in criminal courts at some point in the metaverse, although I can see some issues with that, right? Uh, the metaverse and this kind of technology is really going to impact the legal world um, on many different um, levels. Other um, uses, immersive exper experiences, um, Kenton um, Bryce at the University of Oklahoma uh, created a 360 degree video of water reclamation site for a natural uh, resources class that really allowed the um, students to experience water reclamation and what they were learning and really see and understand. And instead of having to go physically to the site, they were able to do it in the classroom. This is an opportunity for you to bring it in and um, and give your students experiences. Uh, Just Legal VR, which uh, Jenny uh, told me about, is a company that is creating a courtroom experience with VR. Um, and it, they're, um, they actually give you, oh, I'm gonna drag this. Can you guys see that? If I drag it, okay. Um, this is a um, relatively new company. Um, they provide you with your VR system, with the software embedded in the VR system. And I don't know, Jenny, do you know if they're going to make it downloadable? Um, it's supposed to be available before. I think it's the Oculus. The Oculus, oh. which is this. They, uh, they did a new one because I don't want to make a whole bunch. Yeah. So this is really exciting to me. Because if any of you have taught new court and then in the world these past few years and the virtual new court experiences, I did the space law new court the past two years online. It is not the most, it's good, but it's not as good as being in person, right? Um, the students, the feedback um, for my students who participated in the new court was they really wish they had that opportunity to be physically present. Now the VR can potentially provide that um, experience to them without physically being there. Problem with the metaverse. 
The technology is new, but it's getting there. Um, things to, that are required, 3D, 360 cameras, if you're going to start building metaverses, virtual reality hardware, so the Oculus Quest, um, which I have here, um, PlayStation, there's quite a few headsets that are becoming available. They're becoming more affordable. So now is a, where you can start practicing and looking at it, maybe experimenting in your classrooms or at your schools and using these. The Oculus Quest is at around 250 to 350, depending on the size of the storage you get. Um, and then think about it. If you're creating universes, universes, online universes, they're going to be created and are being created by artificial intelligence right now with the big companies. Blockchain is part of um, the building of these. Um, you need the content creation software if you don't have the coders <laughs> or the builders of it. So Roblox has some content creation um, software. Adobe has Audition and um, Aereo. Um, there's quite a few software companies starting to get into the building of the metaverse. But generally, it's being done right now by big companies like Meta, who have their own um, teams that are starting to build this. So I think the technology for law schools is one of the barriers, right? The cost of it, but not only the cost of the hardware, but the people and the manpower of it and having um, that. So barriers and concerns um, with using the, um, uh, with implementing the metaverse and legal education needs to be built first. I think we're gonna see companies like Just VR and other education, legal educational companies start maybe trying to um, use this um, to, um, market <laughs> and then also um, build software for us to use. Um, it requires substantial, substantial computing power. I don't think we're anywhere near where we need to be to actually create a real metaverse, right? And the cost is prohibitive, it's labor um, intensive. And then you gotta think about how to get your school on board. Buy in from faculty and students. Some students do not like implementing new technology. It is very difficult for not, um, some students to really get on board. A lot of students prefer the one on one teaching. So, that, you know, there is a learning curve with this kind of um, technology. Um, I will just say, I just started playing around with this. At the same time, I got progressive lenses. <laughs> Not a good idea. I, no, I can't see anything. <laughs> so, and then I have new contacts. I couldn't even use my contacts. So I'm trying to figure out, like, it, there's barriers. There's physical barriers with using the technology as it um, exists now. Um, also, there are some issues about um, student privacy. If we are using third-party um, vendors, how are we going to stop them from using information about our students? So we have to start thinking about the laws, the um, privacy laws, and how they implement that. I think my time's up, so I'll end there, and then I'll take questions. We're going to do questions at the end. Oh, I'm playing Pokemon Go. Is that okay? My favorite VR game is one where you're a cat and you just get to knock things off. <laughs> Screen share still happening here? Um, it should be there somewhere. I think I just closed out my own. Yeah, Oh, eventually that's what I want. Next up, next up is Debbie Ginsburg, and she's going to talk about we don't talk about NFTs, why they persist, 
and what they mean for law, law schools, and law libraries. A talk that she's been waiting many years to give. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, today. Um, well, apparently XKCD has been waiting a long time to give it because they figured it out in 2008. They're always ahead of time. There's always an XKCD. That's actually Bruno via the NFT, but that's it's Bruno Mars. Close enough. So every time I try to research NFTs, I sort of get into this once a year, or at least in the last couple of years, uh, the market then collapses, uh, which makes for some really interesting presentations uh, when you're sort of talking about a negative. My name is Debbie Ginsberg. I used to be educational technology librarian here at Chicago Kent. Now I'm faculty services librarian at Harvard, but I'm still really interested in technology and some of the implications. Uh, to stick with my 15 minutes, I'm going to retain my talking speed. Uh, hopefully it will work. Um, and uh, tell you what I've been learning about NFTs. And one of the things I've learned is they, they appear in your fortune cookies. Uh, went to get some time for lovely classes the other day, and we found out to Doji Doge World and, you know, all the people who care about with diamond hands, so we can, um, you know, rake in all that cash. Um, sponsored by FTX. We cannot avoid them, even if we try. So what I'm going to cover today, we're going to talk about what NFTs are, non-fungible tokens. What does that mean? We're going to talk about legal issues. Um, does anyone remember Oz from Buffy the Vampire Slayer? He's having some problems. Um, some implications for law schools and libraries. NFTs are in the news. They've been in the news a lot, even if they are under collapse. So we have um, an actor who is going to launch a Web3 writer's room where um, apparently people can make their own intellectual property and get royalties. Uh, so they can participate that way. Salesforce has decided to do um, come up with an NFT cloud for reasons that we haven't figured out yet, but maybe we'll figure out later. Uh, and of course, uh, for Seth Green, he had bought an NFT called Board Ape. He bought this, this thing, and it was going to star in his new show, but somebody fished him and was able to take uh, several of his NFTs, including this one, so now it can't star in the show. Darkwing84 has it, and the question is, can he get it back? We're going to see a lot about Seth Green and his Board Ape. So what is an NFT? This is an NFT. You, you can go onto a market and buy it. What do you buy? So again, it's non-fungible token. That means it can't be exchanged readily. So if I have a Bitcoin and you have a Bitcoin, we can exchange Bitcoin. But if I have an NFT and you have an NFT, we don't necessarily, can't necessarily trade it outright. There is a lots of different kinds of um, databases called blockchains out there. We're going to get a little bit into it. Um, so people who need an introduction will have that foundation. And it's usually called, uh, hosted on a fairly popular one called Ethereum. And as I said before, um, they tend to rise in popularity and then collapse suddenly. And now we're in the collapse suddenly uh, phase of things. We'll see what happens later. It was a $17 billion industry last year. Um, not sure what it's going to be this year. Long way. So. This is an NFT. You can buy it. Um, and each of these non-fungible soups are very different from one another. So you can't have a fungible soup and exchange it with another person who also has a non-fungible soup. They, you have to buy and sell them. And you can you know, buy them for a certain amount of um, currency, but this is cryptocurrency. Uh, for the most part, someone's coming up with a way to buy it with cash. But right now, you have to use cryptocurrency to buy it. So you need a special cryptocurrency through Ethereum to buy these non-fungible soups. So can't exchange one for another. A token is a blockchain asset. It's an asset on a blockchain database. So all these tokens are alike, except for the numbers. But again, you can't exchange one for um, another because each of these tokens is unique, which is why they have different prices. Sometimes the different prices have to do with the number that they have. So this is like 1339, and it's worth a little bit less than um, 5865. Don't know why the market has its own culture and ways that it behaves. And then it is stored on a blockchain. So you've got you know, special blockchains for Bitcoin and Binance and Doge, and then you have the Ethereum blockchain. It's this blockchain that many, many of these NFTs are stored on. Blockchains are a database where um, you are constantly adding new data at the end of the database, and you can't change the data that's already there. This is the purposes of this discussion. So blockchains, they have a block of data, and then they use um, special computational features to connect each block 
to the next block with a chain. Um, it's usually those computational features that cause a lot of the environmental problems. And then there generally tends to be many, many copies of the chain uh, at the blockchain that different users have access to, um, and they can compare it with one another. So this is how we keep these uh, blockchains secure. The information not secure is you use the special computations uh, in the chain, keeps those blocks secure, and then everyone that is involved, it can be anyone who, who wants to participate, there's no organization involved with many blockchains, uh, can take a look and compare and make sure that the data on each of copy of the database is correct. And that applies both with what we know as cryptocurrency and with assets like NFTs. But cryptocurrency is not Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has its own database. We sometimes call it the blockchain. And there's, you know, anyone can download a copy of the blockchain. But in general, the Bitcoin database is used just for Bitcoin. It's not used for other things. So people don't put NFTs or other assets on there. They needed a more robust blockchain database to do this. We need a more robust database. So they usually use Ethereum, which can run programs. It's also a cryptocurrency and it can store assets like NFTs. And they're very excited about this because this is where most NFTs are stored. So it's just one of these blockchains um, and one of these types of blockchains that has taken over most of the market. And that's where you're going to find them. You can buy um, your NFTs freely if you want, um, if you've got cryptocurrency, uh, through markets like OpenSea. So OpenSea is a market lots of people uh, can create or um, buy their NFTs there. They like to feature new artists on the front page. Um, it generates a lot of uh, hype and um, it's a, you know, it's the most popular place right now to buy it. And most of, generally these are gonna be on um, Ethereum. I think they all are. So let's talk about some specific NFTs. This is a board ape. All these are bored apes. The NFTs generally are, are come around a pattern, and then um, someone has used an algorithm to generate many, many different variations on that pattern. So you can see there's lots and lots of different kinds of bored apes. And until I think today, I think there's a new number one collection today, but generally bored apes are the most popular collection for some reason. So Ethereum, which was uh, 1795 when I looked a couple of hours ago, um, and dollars. Um, it, you know, this is a hundred of them, so it's like, you know, nearly $180,000 to buy this board ape, but you have to purchase it with 100 Ethereum uh, coins instead. So, but, and you can purchase any of these different ones or sell it. So you can see this one was last sold at trade five and now is 98. So someone's really, really hopeful that they're going to make a lot of money out of this. Um, and this is the collection that uh, Seth Green lost. You can also buy, uh, there's an NFT restaurant. Um, you may see something missing from this um, menu. Um, the restaurant doesn't exist yet. The NFT lets you have the right to make reservations. Sounds great. Um, you can. There's a singer from Europe who's selling scans for her different body parts, so you can collect them. Collectibles are really big on NFTs. Games are really uh, getting uh, into the NFT. Sometimes it's for an object. Sometimes in this one, you get to uh, the NFT gets your rights to have a say in where the game goes next. So we have all of these different kinds of NFTs, art NFTs, rights to NFTs, um, you know, governance NFTs, collectible NFTs. But what is it we actually get? So if I get the board A and I buy that NFT, do I have the file that has the board A in it? Do I own that file? Can I do what I want? No one else has that file. If I get the game, do I have the code for the game? Uh, that's you know, my part and no one else's. Restaurant, do I have some aspect of the restaurant or the body part? Do I have the scan? And the answer for almost, in almost every uh, instance is no. I don't have any of that. I have a little bit of data about the object, something that says I have ownership, and then I have a link to an outside server that where the object itself is or where in other information about that object is. So all I have is some information. This is what I have. I have this little tiny bit on this database. That is what I have if I buy an NFT. And all the other people, this, 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 yeah, that's what they have. You don't have a thing. You have a space on a database in almost every instance. So you are here. That is it. And yet, there's a lot going on. So the law is has some interesting things to say about NFTs. They're still, like the metaverse, they're still working a lot of this out. 
So Seth Green, he had an NFT, he uh, in a phishing scheme that opened up his digital wallet, he um, gave his credentials out and someone stole several of his NFTs, including his board ape. The board ape NFT gave him a license that said, you can do whatever you want with this. You can use it to make money. Um, it shows whatever you want, you get the right to do this. But now he doesn't have it, what's he left with? Well, did he have a security? That's always the first question everyone has with stuff on the blockchain, is it a security? And there's a test called the Howey test that can walk us through whether something is a security or not. So in this case, yes, he invested money. It is in a common enterprise. He did expect profit, but he was going to do it himself. Like he is the person in charge of the profit. So let's say that restaurant, instead of giving you the right to make reservations, gave you part of the profits. Maybe that you're getting into securities land. Or if you remember that actor that had opened the web 3.0 space for um, creating IP where you could get royalties, now we have a question there too. So it's not that they can't be, but in this case it's not. What about the crime that was committed against him? He was fished, something was stolen from him. What about this? Um, and people are being charged for issues. So if you never open C that I showed you with those beautiful art on the front page and there's all new kinds of art, well, it turns out the person who knew that that art was going to be posted, whose job it was to post that art, uh, kept buying the art low and selling it high, and now the Department of Justice is involved. So we're seeing issues like that. We also see issues where someone's like, I'm going to set up this great NFT, and you should invest in it early, and they all do. And remember, everything is not on the blockchain, but it's in a separate server. Bye-bye server, bye-bye your investment. Rug pulling, and many other scams as well. But the problem with these things on these decentralized block time is the whole point of that is to be decentralized. So if I have my very little Bitcoin that I have, because um, I bought $10 of it when I first started researching like 10 years ago, or I guess seven, when is 2017? Five years ago. Um, you know, if someone somehow manages to go through, you know, um, a third party, you can't take it off the blockchain, but you go through a third party, steal my credentials, and now you have my Bitcoin. There's no one I can go to. I can't go to the Bitcoin organization and say, give it to me, give it back to me. Um, Seth Green can't go to Ethereum and say, give, it, give me back my ape. He can't go to OpenSea, which also uh, is involved in selling this, and say, give it back to me. There's no one whose job it is to do that. So he's not sure who can help him. So he, he can sue, but there's, that's one of the issues we're having in this space is who is in charge of when something goes wrong with the consumer, something goes wrong in general. Um, in general, everyone says, well, that's just the way this works, and you're out of luck. Intellectual property is where things get really interesting. And I just found a whole new article that just turned everything upside down that I already knew about this. Because this is just an ongoing issue. What is owned? One of the more straightforward things is why there's often copyright claims or trademark claims that are being made about things that people make NFTs of. So someone's like, I'm going to make an NFT involving all the stuff with Dune. And like, you don't own the copyright for Dune. That's not going to happen. Um, or, um, Metaburgans. The start is like, I'm going to make these Metaburgans as like an, an artistic statement about Hermes. And Hermes is like, no, that's our trademark. You can't do it. To bring Rebecca Tushnet up a second time today, she's the artist represent, or she's the lawyer representing the artist. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. The other big problem is licensing. And I cannot get a clear picture of what licensing you get with a board ape. Does board ape, not club, which is the people who made it, own the copyright? Or does uh, does it go with the um, actual NFT? Does Seth Green still have access to his license or did it go with the NFT and the person who now has it has the license and the ability to make the show? There are so many questions about where, the, what, what transfers with what, that is a really unsettled question. So if people are looking for ways to teach NFT in law school, particularly in IT, this idea of this is not settled, people are still arguing about it, this is a lot of good hypos right here as to what gets transferred when you transfer an NFT to someone else. So maybe he lost his license. Maybe he can just say, I'm going to use it. What are you going to do, sue me? Um, he is going to pursue lit litigation. At least that's his current plan. So we'll see what happens and what the courts say. But courts tend to not really always understand everything about the technologies they're using so, or they're looking at. So we'll see how well this works. Um, what are law schools doing? So you know, there's a lot going on here, even if NFTs are not as popular as they once were, they're not going away. They're going to have implications for a long time and digital assets are going to have uh, implications for a long time. So Miami Law has an NFT course where the students created a license for a gaming company. 
some libraries like to do quick little videos explaining what MFCs are because it's still important that students know and others know what they are. So there's different uh, ways that law schools have dealt with this. And to go back to the presentation that Jenny Wondrasek and I did last week about how to teach technology, it's always a great idea to integrate technology instruction into your other courses. Are NFT smart contracts contracts? Are they smart? What happens if you divorce and someone has an NFT or a will and someone has an NFT? Or you have a clinic where people actually have to deal with NFTs as they had to do in that course. So there's a lot of opportunities for law schools to deal with some of the issues. What about libraries? And that's a more interesting thing. Obviously, we have an educational component that we can be part of. We can teach others about it. I've been wondering, well, what happens if someone donates an NFT to a library? And maybe the director just says, no, we're not dealing with that. Um, or maybe they try to integrate it, or maybe some vendors like, yeah, this is going to be an NFT or some other kind of digital asset, and you're just going to have to deal with it. So just be aware of it, if not an expert in it, and, um, and that, that's going to help you. So how to start. I'm going to put up some resources on how you can learn the basics. Explore your local issues. Like, I didn't know that Harvard had given its class of 2021 NFTs. Now I want to know more. What are these NFTs? What do they do? How do you exchange them? Where do they put them? Um, so you can do that. And also, it's always uh, great to educate your community through prescribed videos. The more you uh, produce, the more you learn, and the more you educate your constituents. Because if you don't do it, students will. Literally, a student has posted their contracts outlined as an NFT in OpenSea. No one's buying it, but it's there. So if they're getting into it, if they're already there, we need to be there too. This is also going to have long-term implications as there could be another rise. We're seeing NFTs in games, an object you can take from one game to another. We're seeing it in the metaverse where uh, different parts of you know, it could be a company that has many, many different parts and something you buy in one part of the internet space of this company can be used in another place. Somebody might be saying, okay, I'm going to give you, let you buy NFTs that are, let you have rent rights to this building. Well, that's going to be interesting. How does that work? And what are the implications of the digital wallet where the NFTs are stored? Let's say somebody puts something in your wallet that you don't want there. Now, what do you do? So there, this is not going away, even if NFTs themselves are not popular. There are long-term implications for digital assets that we need to think about. So I'm wishing us good luck in this doge doge world of everything with NFTs. You can't escape it even at a restaurant. And I'm hoping, or at least my cats are hoping, that maybe you have some questions for us, for me, well, the cats too, um, at the end of the rest of this presentation. Now it's time for a video. How do I put the video up? Turn off the same screen. Stop there. Thank you. Okay. Move the screen over. Out we go. I don't know where the video is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a video, it's actually a live person. Oh, it's another person? It is. Oh, I thought there was just going to be two of us. No, there's a third person. Let's see, we will come up. So, up next. Oh, I'll come on down. You're the next person. Um, so, uh, so, so up next, um, with his session, Black Mirror, the one, two, threes, and ABCs of digital well being. We just need to share a screen. Oh, I was making sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Paul Jane. I'm the legal and education technology specialist uh, and adjunct professor of law at Brooklyn Law School, uh, where I teach technology and law in practice. I'm also the current director of technology, um, and I just realized the weird irony dichotomy of, <laughs> of the metaverse and NFTs, and then we're closing out with, let's step back a bit. <laughs> so um, as I only have 15 minutes, uh, let's get started. Back in the day, when we wanted to share information, it looked something like this. Then we figured out a way to share information faster. 
Over time, our desire to share information led to increasingly complex technology that could share news faster and faster. The people who created this technology envisioned a future where we could share information instantly. They dreamed that we would make connections that would lead us to a greater understanding. Funny thing is, the more connected we are, the less we want to hear what anyone else has to say. Guys, dinner's ready. Dinner! <laughs> oh, hmm. dinner's ready. Why didn't you just tell us? <laughs> All right. Uh, so what is digital well-being to them? And them being Apple and Google, the two main people, the two main companies that kind of you know run our lives. Um, and I'm not going to say the entire thing, but basically the big takeaway from the quotes uh, from when they kind of released a lot of their big digital well-being initiatives was balance. We want you to keep using our stuff, but don't get too hooked that, you know, it gets us in trouble. Um, and whether or not that's uh, the right approach to things um, as, you know, we kind of go back to being in person or hybrid from the pandemic. It is a key thing to know that, you know, just everything in moderation, right? So, and if for those who are uh, joining us in the chat, please feel free to type in, uh, what does well, digital well-being mean to you? So for me, it means number one, being comfortable without my device like on me. You know, I can go to a water fountain without needing to put my phone in my pocket and sleep behind. Two is destroying the mother or YouTube or Instagram, right? Um, and then the, for me, digital well-being means not going over 274 flips. I have the Galaxy flip phone, right? So I open up, close, open, close. Apparently, it's rated for 200,000 flips over its lifetime. Um, you'll see later that I'm kind of hovering around 200, so it's kind of there. So for me, uh, we're going to divide it up. The ABCs of digital well-being is alerts, blue light, and control, which means notification reduction, making sure your physical wellness of using these devices are you know, uh, being, uh, being addressed, and control as in your device management or your content management. So. Alerts, we all know we've all received our badges and banners and pops and notification center uh, uh, alerts, right? In addition, all the other alerts that come in are things like spam calls or just people who call you all the time. Now, whether or not that's a call that you actually want or not, just know that it's still something that brings something to your attention. And kind of addressing whether or not I need to know this all the time, but not all the time, right? Maybe a good example is you see these notifications from Twitter or YouTube or other applications that says, that like pushes out notifications saying, hey, this might be interesting to you, but do you really need to know that all the time? Like in comparison to when you get an email. So how do we reduce our notifications, right? So uh, a lot of people have iPhones, uh, and I'm sure everyone has used a do not disturb function, whether in a meeting or whether in like a you know bedtime setting. So you can, in addition, you can ad adjust in the, the alert style and notification sounds, meaning do you want it to be intrusive? Do you want to come out as like a banner system? Do you want to make that notification silent? And then uh, when it comes to spam calls, contact your carrier for spam filter directions. Um, carriers usually have it on default these days, like T-Mobile. at t has it where it's automatically named as telemarketer or spam risk. But now please know that all three of the big three networks work together to reduce spam calls. Um, going back to the adjust and alert style of notification sounds, you know, take it from me. At a certain point, I used to get very anxious hearing the Outlook notification sound. Um, and if you feel anxious when you hear these notifications, take it as a physical cue, you know, that um, 
you need to take steps to, I guess, decrease these notifications. So a little, uh, not demonstration, but little screenshots of how you can do it. From the, this is an Android phone on the left two photos is you can bring down from the status bar. Do you only want the three most recent notifications? Do you want all of them? Or, and then you can kind of tailor and customize it saying, I want you know my LED to go off or I want my sound to turn off. And similar ways you can do it for the iPhone. Um, this is app specific. You have Outlook and you have WhatsApp. They're all there and you're, you can see it in the notification section. So for blue light, it's a, again, it's a catch all phrase because I needed a D for the ADCs, is physical wellness. So not necessarily just the blue light, but using technology, we've become accustomed to certain habits, right? We have a laptop, the laptop's here, and we might slouch down, right? Or our hands might have that claw feature when using mice. So including eye strain, your posture, and the lack of sleep. So a lot of our devices now come with, well, let's just say, for example, the mobile devices, they now have the blue light filters uh, installed. Um, if you don't, then you can also get a blue light filter, which means that it kind of makes everything on a warmer hue. It, may, it doesn't get rid of all the blue light because depending on the display technology, you can't. You can also install a program that changes the temperature of the screen. You can also add ergonomic additions, whether or not be a laptop stand, like I'm using right now, or uh, a special keyboard. In addition, depending on how you have your screen set up, you can use a scale display, meaning you can have things zoomed in by default or a little smaller if you'd like to, to reduce your eye strain. So uh, here it is on the Mac. You can see if you want the more larger text or more space. Same thing for Windows, when you change your scale. In addition, you can change your, uh, to reduce the contrast and uh, uh, reduce the eye strain is, you know, turn into dark mode. So I'm gonna go, as I talk, you can read, you know, studies and surveys have associated electronic use with a lack of sleep in three different ways. The first is just the time spent on the devices, displacing sleep, right? So I do a bad thing called revenge sleeping, where <laughs> I um, don't go to sleep because I come home late and I wanna do fun things, so I don't sleep. Um, so that also includes like electronics device use. Number two is the media use just as a rule excites and stimulates the brain, right? So if, if that's the point, then you're just not in a headspace where you can go to sleep because uh, you're so broke up about something that you read on Twitter. Uh, and who hasn't doom scrolled before? And three, and it's a little more controversial, as I mentioned before, is that the idea that the light emissions coming from the screen affects and straining eyes, you know, causes a lot of changes to your eyes, you know, aka the blue light. But that being said, um, blue light filters are, however, very effective to create a physical cue of time to sleep, right? Like, oh, hey, my things came on. Maybe I should kind of start winding down now. Um, and, you know, as <laughs> the kids say, you know, go touch grass. What I'm showing here for those who are in Chicago is on the leftmost is the date, sunrise and sunset. So if you have time, you know, just go outside with some vitamin D, uh, here's the sunset times for Chicago. <laughs> All right, and going to the C is um, device management. So taking affirmative actions to reduce your actual usage on your phone, be it hardware, software, or apps. Earlier I mentioned moving the, um, you know, how I had a muscle memory going, I open my screen, unlock, I go to a certain app, right? So move the app away from the home screen. Just create that extra little step. That's that's the visual representation. <laughs> Take that extra step, and you don't have to automatically click it every single time. Um, you can also might think about using specific use hardware. 
right? Bring back that Kindle if you, you want to read it you know, instead of on your phone or your iPod, like an actual iPod for music. Um, I can see how it's very impractical, but you know, you have the added benefit of confusing Gen Z students. <laughs> uh, and more, you know, severely and maybe not the most helpful, right, is installing self-control software. Self-control software includes things like, you know, um, screen time. And these specific software, self-control is for Mac, rescue time is for the desktop and mobile, both, both sides, cold turkey is for Mac and Windows, Freedom is on an extension for the browser and iOS. And these programs help you say, you know, I want to spend only this time, much time on a program or this much time on a website. And you can set, have those settings and make it so that, you know, it'll take a lot to deactivate the program. Um, think of it as a weird kind of little sponsor for digital detoxing. So this is a approximation of my screen time for my own phone. On the left is my daily average screen time, which is not great, right? Uh, in the middle is the notifications I received. Let's ignore the clock uh, for 251 notifications received for the clock because that's the morning, but we can focus on the 100 emails I received or the 84 text messages I received, right? Um, and then if you, on the very bottom right side, you'll see that I opened my phone 179 times on a certain day. Um, the point of this is to maybe it'll help guilt you, shame you in knowing that, oh, maybe I do need to kind of chill out a little bit, take some time, shut my phone. Um, content management, you know, here's Candy Crush, which I still think is popular amongst certain people. <laughs> The muscle memory aspect of it, uh, and these games are meant to be, you know, small bits of content, right? So when you have the things like freemium games, games that are free, um, it's like a Skinner box. You have small hits of instant gratification, where lights and sounds trigger accomplishment, but you want to come back for more and more and more, uh, or you turn out to, you know, uh, spend money. The questions you have to ask yourself is that: Do you really need all these, uh, you know, games or contents or subscriptions, right? So this is a little outdated, but still the same thing happens um, is if what happens if you have all of the streaming platforms, right? And it kind of evens out to be about $80 a month. So we've essentially rediscovered a cable. <laughs> um, and you have to ask yourself, do I really need all these things? You know, do I really need, uh, do I really need stars basically? Um, and that's a personal decision. I get that. And I know people share passwords, but uh, when you start kind of viewing it from the lens of cost and amount and just available content, it's easier, it's easier to see where, oh, I'm starting to get a little, a little overwhelmed. Uh, last bit about uh, content. And much like Debbie, I also like SKCD is, you know, if you have a website where you have endless scrolling, there's a way to turn it off. Either by extensions, you disable JavaScript, or in the case of Reddit, you go to old.reddit.com. Um, for apps, there's also the take a break function, right? So let's go to Instagram, for example, where you can go to your activity, your time spent, you see that there in the third uh, screenshot, and you can use set daily time limit, right? And it'll prompt you or send you a reminder saying, hey, you've been on this a lot. It'll essentially shame you to shut the app off. Same thing for YouTube. Time watch. Remind me to take, take a break. Remind me when it's bedtime. Um, can't tell if that was actually 15 minutes. However, please go ahead and, and use the QR code. It is, uh, well, this was kind of set up for the students. Um, I think this would be good for everybody and anyone can use. Uh, BrokeLaw.care is our partnership with Timely MD, which is a virtual wellness center for students. Um, it, it easily integrates with existing domains like Microsoft Azure or other SSO platforms. So if this is something that you think your students would like or use, you know, that this is an option, this is what it looks like. The second link is an uh, ABA, is a well-being toolkit in a nutshell uh, uh, presented by the ABA. 
third link is Mindfulness in Law Society. Is uh, The Law Society is a 501c3 nonprofit that seeks to educate, coordinate, and promote activities in the legal profession relating to mindfulness, meditation, yoga, and contemplative practices. Read the copy down here. Fourth link is experiments with Google. So Google has done these experiments where they crowdsource all of these digital well-being experiments from other people, one of which includes making a paper phone where you print out a few sheets of paper, you fold it in a way, it looks like a phone, it has the weather, contacts, map, a to-do list. So you can leave your phone behind and go on your day. Um, fifth is a Wall Street Journal video where people can, uh, there's a Wall Street Journal video of an ergonomics expert saying, this is what you need to do to have good physical posture, presence, and working environment. And the last one is a 40% discount off the Calm app. So first time presenter, I brought you a present. Um, I think we are at time, so apologies for that. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you to John Mayer and Elmer Masters. And I don't, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Don't know where we are now. Oh, where, can you hear me? Hey. Um, we're at the question and answer part, or at least the question part of the thing. So um, we do have some questions. And um, we're gonna have to do questions. There you go, we have a chair. I'm just gonna swing some cameras around. Pretty cool. Okay, so I got a, I got a few questions here online. We'll do these real quick, and then uh, we should still have time for a couple more. Uh, first question is, uh, how is I'm going to paraphrase this a little. How is uh, metaverse different from Second Life, and why won't it why won't it all fail like Second Life? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the meta, Second Life is its own virtual world. It's a, it's its own entity. Um, the metaverse is broader. Think of multiple second lives all put together. Or if Facebook, which is this is one of the problems, probably never happened. If Meta works with Google and somehow puts together and builds their metaverses and then allows people to communicate across them. So um, and it, it might fail. And it might come out to not be what we think it's going to be. It's kind of hard to predict what the future is because it is the future, um, how, what it's going to look at like, because a lot of the development's going to be through private companies. And so unless um, we have uh, nonprofits and schools making a metaverse that really is for everyone and not just to make money, um, we really need to think about how we build it. And, and it's important to note that Second Life has not failed. Um, <laughs> Labs is still out there. Second Life still runs. They have about almost a million active monthly users. Oh. <laughs> Just because John let his account lapse, that's a fail. <laughs> <that it's okay. laughs> Um, okay, and then uh, one more question. Uh, this one uh, also about, uh, I guess, also about the metaverse. Yes. Um, any thoughts on a possible legal system in the metaverse comparable to a real life legal system, i.e., laws, court system, lawyers, judges, jails, etc.? Um, this is something that probably needs to be talked about uh, as a legal profession. I can see it being developed, but there's hurdles. If you've ever worked as a law clerk for an elderly judge, there's the, they probably are not going to like it. There are serious privacy issues at having courts in the metaverse um, and um, you know having sealed documents being presented in the metaverse unless the government builds a portion that's highly secured. Um, but I do see that it, it could be a possibility in the very, very long future. So I'm thinking like 20 years. Um, but we need to start talking about it now and experimenting it with it to see and talk about the ethics of it and the, the problems with it. Um, that was all the online questions we had. Do we have uh... 
Anybody else? Anyone? 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 Yeah. I have a question for Daddy. So the NFT market that you talked about, OpenSea, is it like eBay where my grandma's, you know, ugly plate is up there and she thinks it's worth ten thousand dollars, but no one's bidding on it? Yes. Or okay. <laughs> or it's, it's you know fifty thousand dollars for the ape that has you know leopard spots on it. Yeah. No one is buying that. Yeah. I mean sometimes it, it's yeah sometimes right, it, but it's, it's not value yeah. is yeah completely random. Yeah. yeah, that's why because that's why it's non fungible. The value is set by whoever declares it has that value. Also, one bit of breaking news that I learned, like, as I sat down, Seth Green has his board eight perk. My presentation now makes sense. Tom Ryan is acting as our fact checker on everything. <laughs> that's actually, I actually really like your question and made me think of another one. There's another kind of tag test also seemed sort of dubious at first, but then sort of gathered steam after a while. I think in the 3D printing, where people were making nothing, right? And then they figured out, oh, you did it in acetone and it's smooth, or you, you know, or you use a different material and all of a sudden it's worth something. And so it took, it was like the seed processing, and then there was like a burst, and then what? And then it sat and sat and sat, and now there's patent manufacturing all over the place, you know, to make molds, that kind of stuff. Do you think that? Well, I, I still don't have NFT and also blockchain. Or blockchain too. So that's something I'm thinking about for a while. Also, one of the things about 3D printing, of course, the cost has come down. Like, yeah, you know, I could buy last year I bought my son a 3D printer, which he doesn't use for for 150, where like before it was like you know seven hundred thousand dollars. So what? Yeah, sure. Um, and then but yeah, so the blockchain, the thing I like about blockchain in particular is the idea of this immutable database which is not necessarily in the core uh, control of the corporation so people are thinking oh okay maybe we can put identities someplace more secure than we have now it doesn't look like the block a blockchain is the right way so maybe something else decentralized nfts the idea of a digital asset where people you know have ways of, of exchanging it um outside of normal channels may be interesting nfts as they're done now it's like the blockchain. It's got so many problems. The people who are in control of it are so problematic. And of course, there are the huge environmental issues as well. So it's hard to say something's decentralized when it's actually in the control of a very limited set of people who have their own very precise and specific um, set of ideas and, and agenda. I have a question for Paul. So, so now, that, now that you've been using these tools to improve your life has your life improved or are you just stressed are you just more aware of your stress <laughs> i i am much more aware of let's just say it, this is a do as i say not as i do situation <laughs> um but that being said um it's always what this hat what, what these things do is let me know that uh, you hear that now uh, <laughs> Sorry. It is an ever presence, and um, I just got to chill out. So that happens every now and then during the day. It's like, okay, that's just too much. Let's put this away. Time to play Wordle, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Paul. Has this been integrated anyway in like your academic success program where your student leaders are referring students back to these sorts of tools? Um, I doubt faculty are mentioning them unless somebody's in crisis. I'm not exactly sure for our like um, our ASPs, um, but however, you know, we do sessions in our library for like drop a session, say, you know, I give this presentation, we give the discount, and we let them know of our wellness section, right? It's also been very difficult as <laughs> we get back into the swing of things uh, post pandemic. And, you know, this will be the first, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, real in person back, right? And at that point, the shift would be less from virtual and more in person. Um, and where the virtual uh, interactions are with like, OCI for interviews or other competitions. Um, so we're kind of still assessing what that's going to look like in the fall. So just to the um, Karina's virtual world governance, there's a show on Amazon called Upload that deals with uploading your, you can die or you can upload yourself to the cloud and you continue living. But it has the issues of like, poor people versus rich people and what kind of assets you get in this like universe and 
They have um, virtual reality where your loved ones can come visit you in this alternate space. And so it's an interesting, how would this work in reality sort of show. Right, but to be uploaded, they have to scan your head, yeah. which is terminal because- uh, Not know, in the second season. Well, no. You might be able to come back to well, download well, they, the risk yeah, to another body. So now do we have a two Riker situation? Yeah. <laughs> you come back to someone else's body. Yeah. And, but that's yeah, it just gets weirder. Okay, um, we're going to take a little bit long. Those folks online, we've got another vendor session coming up, and then we'll be back at three o'clock central time with the uh, with whatever's next. I don't know who's doing. It. Anybody know? Oh, right, you're at the tail end. Yeah. So we've got some other virtual folks coming at three o'clock, and then um, and then John will have the last fifteen minutes. Let's see how that's going. And we've got, I think, ProServus is going to be our vendor session between here. So I'm going to kill this one. And we'll start now. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. I don't know what to do now.